It's incredible to be here to celebrate this utterly amazing exhibition. It's amazing because it's presenting an incomparable, important, significant artist. It's amazing because it's an incredibly historic intervention into this museum's history. It's amazing because it reminds us of the way in which artists can have an impact in so many different moments, in so many different ways. So I am thrilled to be here, to be in this conversation. Um, it's always amazing for me to be in this building. As many of you know, I began my curatorial career at the Whitney Museum, which is what this used to be. Um, you know, I have to do lots of verbal gymnastics when I say that, because I say, you know, the Frick Madison, which was the Met Breuer, which was the Whitney Museum, which is where I worked. Right? People say, oh, you work downtown. No, I worked right here. 945 Madison. And it was in this museum where I had the chance to present Barclay's work, but I got to know Barclay's work at the museum where I am now privileged to steward, the Studio Museum in Harlem. So I see a lot of Studio Museum and Harlem family here, so thrilled to see you all as well. But the Studio Museum did an exhibition of Barclay's work in 1980. And in 1985, when I was a sophomore at Smith College and I interned at the Studio Museum, and the head of communications at the Studio Museum, Cheryl Lynn Bruce, sent me back to Smith College with a little tote bag, a Studio Museum branded tote bag, filled with catalogs, in the hope that it would open up my own sense of what art and artists could be. And in that tote bag was that Barclay Hendricks catalog, and I remember reading it and being so compelled by Barclay's vision of a kind of figuration that it then, when it came to 1994 and I had the chance to curate a show here, that. Barclay was at the center of that thinking. So, thrilled to be sitting in all that history. But, to start, Amy, if you could just give us a little bit of history of the Frick, because I think to begin this conversation by beginning to talk about this as an intervention is important. So, thank you, Thelma, okay. and thank you all for being here. Um, I'll start at the very beginning. The Frick Collection is the private collection of Henry Clay Frick, who was a steel industrialist. Robert Barron built one of the most prized collections of old master painting, sculpture, and decorative arts at the beginning of the 20th century. Our recent history is that we are subletting from the Met who is leasing from the Whitney in this building. <laughs> so what you'll see on the, the three floors of this building, which we call Frick Madison to help people navigate themselves here, is the old master collection of the Frick in a very modernist setting. Um, and, and this is the perfect setting for the Barclay Hendricks exhibition, which we came to learn was, the Frick was one of Barclay's most favorite museums. So let's talk about the origin of the idea of this exhibition. Um, not only how you all came together to do this, but even the idea of showing a 20th century artist in the midst of what is our preeminent sort of collection. So I'll just jump in before Antoine can talk about our, our journey our together. Our meeting. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Because we moved into this space, which is very much unlike the Frick Mansion, and for those of you who don't know the Frick Mansion, I, I wouldn't blame you because you could walk by on 70th Street and not know that there's a museum there. It looks like the private home of a very wealthy person. And so some people have not you know, ventured off the street into that museum in the past. When we moved here, which is just a temporary sojourn, people came in here not knowing what was in here because it looks like a museum. You, you can cross this bridge, pay some money or not, and see some art. So it suddenly became a different place to show art and to interact with a new public who just frankly didn't even know or care that we were somewhere else. Because of that, and there was this momentum to sort of engage with new people who were interested in this building, our art here, and a new story that we could tell here. I went on the hunt for a contemporary artist who could help illuminate our historic collection for new eyes. And that is when I had the magical moment of meeting Antoine. Yeah, we, uh, Amy and I met um, in 2001, or 2021, which seems like, you know, 20 <laughs> years ago. Um, and she sent me and my very best friend, Jaja Fay, an email. Um, Ask, I, I don't even know who, I don't even remember who connected us, but asking if we could meet and 
I mean, you ended up meeting right before the exhibition social works, like half an hour before the show I curated. And I was like, I have half an hour. What's going on? What are you thinking? And we just started talking. And when you were sort of talking about the collection, I was like, well, I vaguely sort of remember Barclay Hendricks having their connection to the Frick. And I go, what about Barclay Hendricks? And then that sort of began the journey of... Um, of us sort of thinking about Barclay, about you reaching out to Jack Shaman in the estate. And, um, and then we just sort of started to sort of put together the exhibition and the catalog. And Amy, I know that you began your career as an artist uh, before becoming an art historian. So someone seeped in the history of painting. Antoine, I'm gonna ask you a similar question, but can you talk about the sort of relationship of thinking about Barclay Hendricks' work in relation to works from the past? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, before I got my PhD in Italian Renaissance, 16th century painting, which is, yes, worlds away from Barclay Hendricks. My undergraduate degree was in painting. And one of my ways into art history actually was looking at and imitating and sort of learning from paintings like Manet's Olympia, which is just up the street now at the Met. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I encountered through reliving an art, a historic artist who lived many centuries before and reliving every brushstroke, reliving their moment, was a sense of empathy. Whatever was going on, I could be very mad at Manet, I could be very mad at Gauguin, I could be very mad at any of the misogynistic artists of the past or whatever, but reliving their brushwork created a sense of empathy and connection, almost time travel. And this is, I think, part of what interested me in Barclay's investigations of the past, that he wasn't mad at Rembrandt for not painting a lot of black people. And there's a, there's a video of him in front of the Frick Collection in 2011, having come out of a, an exhibition about Rembrandt. And he's posed this question, so what do you think about Rembrandt not painting very many people of color? And he says, I'm not mad at Rembrandt. I mean, I know what black people are doing at that time. Rembrandt was painting the people with money. And he sort of just accepted the facts of history and sort of empathized the place that Rembrandt was coming from. And, and for me, it, it is that time travel, that being able to connect through person to person, whatever your race is, human to human, for me, happens through looking very, very closely at works of art. And Antoine, you're someone who's a critic, a curator, but very much involved with art of the present. Right? In right. some ways, art of, you know, two weeks from now, right? right? You're <laughs> often, right? You know, yes. if, if you're looking at yeah. it, it means we haven't looked at it exactly. yet, right? We right. haven't seen it yet. Right. Um, but can you talk about, you know, what it means to think about Barclay's work and how you kind of came into this context as someone whose eye and heart in some ways is in the present future? Right. Um, I encountered Barclay Hendricks, um, I think probably in like 2012, I saw a painting somewhere, um, uh, probably at Jack Shaman um, Gallery, and it just sort of opened up everything for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think I've been saying that there's an, there's always an artist that sort of does that for you, right? That sort of gives you the sort of bug to sort of like, you should see more, okay, this is interesting. And so Barclay Hendricks was that artist for me. And then at the time, the only job I had was writing, um, and I would write about different artists and I would just sort of just kept writing about, you know, artists, about mm -hmm. artists of my generation and then older artists and then, you know, sort of, and now, you know, and I got to meet Markley Hendricks when he was, you know, in 2016 and interviewed him and wrote a piece. And so it sort of, that's where the sort of engagement and then he died a year later and I wrote a, a obituary um, about him. And it just sort of had, just had that fascination, that ongoing sort of engagement with just looking at his work. And, and so it really wasn't that far off that I, I actually, it took me longer than, the, than I, I think I otherwise sort of looking back on that conversation, it took me longer to come to Barclay Hendricks because I should, he's always the first artist that like I sort of go back to because of just the people he painted the style and just sort of my own personal connection to those things. One of the most beautiful things that Antoine said in that initial conversation, those initial conversations was that Barclay, you know, and, and he is literally on the pulse of two weeks from now. He said, Barclay's always been his North star. Mm -hmm. And that somebody's in the contemporary sense is historic. You know, a lot of the paintings upstairs on the fourth floor are 50 years old, mm -hmm. but 
there was something resonant with you that Barclay sort of led the way in a sense of even of your feeling at the contemporary moment. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. I'm, I'm going to ask you all to talk about why you focused on Barclay's portraiture. I mean, it's obvious, right? He was a master of portraiture. But what everyone should know is Barclay made lots of kinds of work. Barclay made landscape paintings. He made still life. He was a photographer, took photographs. Barclay was a DJ. You know, I mean, he had many different ways in which he engaged in culture, right? It was common to see Barclay in the context of other art engagements with his camera, right? And he'd be walking around and shooting and documenting in different moments, you know? And he was someone with just a kind of voracious and rigorous curiosity and intellect. That was always my experience with him. But Tell us why you focused on his portraiture. So for us, in our initial conversations, we wanted to be very uh, clear to our audiences to, you know, it takes a lot to put on an exhibition. We wanted it to make immediate sense to everyone who came in why this was happening at the Frick Collection now. And part of that was this now legendary trip that Barclay took as an art student, you know, in his early 20s. In 1966, he had a scholarship for European travel, and he visited every museum in every major city across the continent. And he saw amazing works of art of European tradition that he admired and at the same time saw something missing from. And that was the representation of black figures in a personalizing and humanizing way. And so when he came back to the United States, it was this mission in a sense, the response and admiration, but also correction in a way to old master painting that he came to create this body of work. And some of the paintings on the fourth floor now are really immediately out of that moment. And that really is the direct connection to the Frick, which he saw in a sense, as like the Prado in Madrid, like the National Gallery in London, like the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, for the United States, the Frick was this temple to, as problematic as it is, the greatest achievements of European painting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it was also, for me, I, I like the sort of decade of the 70s just because of that sort of m- the most prolific period that he's sort of making portraits, right? And then he goes off to make landscapes in the 80s and other, and you know, taking photographs all the way through. But it was also, whenever I walked into the Frick, it was always about an engagement with history. And for me, to sort of focus on the 70s, you are having an engagement with black history and then European history, right, to sort of think. And so it was all about sort of like having this sort of, you know, relationship and conversation with different histories and what are those histories and how people can sort of think about those histories in relationship to each other. And so when we sort of settled on that period, yes, it was about sort of like thinking about sort of mastery and proficiency and all of those things, but it was also about like there, there is a black history, there is a black art history, and this is a way to sort of still have a historical conversation, um, but it's also a way to have a historical conversation through blackness, right? And this is something we were talking about earlier, Thelma, and I hope you don't mind me posing a question to you. But, you know, as, as one, literally the pioneers bringing Barclay even on the map of art in the United States, when Barclay was on view here in your show in 1904, here on the third floor, Barclay was a kind of a different artist in the sense of the embrace and in the United States. Now, good luck getting a Barclay Hendrix, okay? But back then, I think it was a little bit of a different story. And I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of the context of your relationship with Barclay over the decades mm-hmm. that you've seen him. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, as I said, I came to know Barclay's work um, when I was a young aspiring curator interning at the Studio Museum. But by the time I started working as a curator in 1991, my own interests were in what was at the center of black art practice of that time, and that was conceptual art. So I was trying to reconcile what it meant to have had this whole history through the 60s and the 70s of black artists working in figuration and abstraction. Almost all of them, save maybe Norman Lewis, were alive at that time, so it meant I was engaging with them. And when I set out to make an exhibition in 94, which very much was looking at creating a kind of art history around black conceptual practice about identity and race, it felt necessary that it be grounded in this figurative tradition. And at the core of that was Barclay's work. Now, it also was because at that moment in the 90s, we were all having great nostalgia for the 
70s, right? Pop, in pop culture, but also in art, as much as it was being rejected in certain ways for more conceptual practices. So in the case of blackmail, all of the works in the exhibition I borrowed from collections. They were in major collections. Barclay had been widely collected through his showing of in the 70s, but then the art world shifted as it does, right? As, as we begin to think and look at different things. And Barclay, to his credit, sort of retreated to Connecticut where he became a professor at Connecticut College. Now this was before the internet. So I borrowed these works, they were in the exhibition, the New York Times did a review and there were pictures of work and that's how Barclay knew he was in the exhibition. Um, <laughs> And he called me. Yeah. Now, as I said, Barkley was a DJ. Barkley had, right, Antoine, he had an amazing voice, you know, one of those right, late yeah. night DJ voices. Right? Yeah, no, seriously. And so Barkley called me with that Barkley voice. Yeah. And was, you know, thrilled to understand the context of the exhibition, which placed him among some peers like Robert Colescott, Adrian Piper, Leon Golub, but a whole generation of, at the time, not so well known young artists such as. Glenn Ligon, Lorna Simpson, Carrie Mae Weems, et cetera. And so Barclay was interested because it was a sort of, you know, double recontextualizing. And it opened up for us a conversation which really, you know, I think along with the conversations of so many artists that I hold dearly in my heart now, like Sam Gilliam, like Elizabeth Catlett, who charged me, right, to hold legacy for them, right? Both in my curatorial work and then, of course, as I moved on to the studio, museum, and institutional work. So, you know, it was a way at the time as a young curator, I was 27 when all that happened, um, as a young curator, it was very much the charge that defined in deep ways um, my work. Now, fast forward, we see how art histories catch up with real life. Right? And so I'm going to ask you now, Antoine, to talk about Barclay's influence on the present, because there's no way to talk about so much of what we engage with now without having Barclay in that yeah, conversation. I, you see it sort of, what I also liked about him is the way that, you know, you can sort of, every, so people are walking to the galleries, as you will, um, in just a moment, and they say, these feel so contemporary, like they were painted That's yesterday. Right. Everyone, right. like that is like mm -hmm. one of the sort of comments that are sort of ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, because as Thelma just said, you know, culture catches up on itself, but he's had a large influence on sort of the way that we think about fashion and the way that we think about sort of music and self-styling. And that just sort of like keeps sort of happening. And, you know, it's like, I was talking to a friend of mine um, and I was telling him, oh, I'm doing this, you know, this um, Barclay Henry show with Amy. And he's like, oh, Tom Ford has a picture on his moon board. And so it's like, you know, like every sort of, you know, it, you know, we can sort of say that, like, maybe he didn't sort of get what he deserved in sort of his lifetime in terms of, like, the admiration um, of the art world, but he was definitely influential, Completely. you know? And Completely. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to ask you the worst question that anyone can ask a curator um, about their own exhibition. But as we said, this is an amazing uh, collection of portraits, but I'm going to ask both of you to talk about one of them. And I want you to do that because, of course, after we talk, everyone's going to get to go upstairs, and I'd love for them to be able to walk into the exhibition with some insight into one or another painting directly from either of you. Amy. Okay, there are 14 pictures, so every day, as we say, we have right. a different favorite. A favorite. <laughs> um, for me, I guess, in terms of the nerdy art historian that I ended up growing up into being, um, the Steve painting at the Whitney, um, which is a white-on-white -white limited palette painting, is both the coolest depiction of a person and one of the nerdiest like art history moments in Barclay's work, which is when you look at this painting, it's in the white on white room, the reflection in the sunglasses has the most finicky, meticulous Jan van Eyck Northern Renaissance architectural detail with a tiny little self-portrait of the artist in the corner, which is so art historical, which go through the centuries and so many artists have engaged with this. And I love this combination between literally the coolest moment in 1975 and a whole history of European painting. I was like thinking, um, I think today it's probably, 
the blood painting because you see so much of sort of the history of painting in that picture, uh, but you also see so much of the time in which he created it. And so like you see the ascendant sort of art historical movements, right? And so you think about the background, which is red. It, it's also a limited palette painting. Um, but then you have like this pop of color, sort of blue here that um, Barclay added himself. Um, and then you just see like, you know, like the different techniques. You have like the sort of pattern that sort of, you know, as everyone has now said, calls out Picasso. And, but then it also has this really sort of fresh um, sort of connection to the future where if you look at the photograph in the, in the catalog, um, which would include um, the pictures that he's taken of, the, of most of the sitters, um, Donald Formey, who is the sitter, is not wearing, he's wearing jeans. And what I liked about that um, in, the, in the painting is that he sort of made him like wear a twin set. And so he's styling these portraits and these people as he's sort of painting them. And I think that like, that's just such a contemporary sort of act, right? So it's not just like he's recording, you know, um, the people as they sort of he's encountering. He is doing that through his photography practice. There are 400,000 photographs that he's taken in his lifetime. Um, but he's also adding his own spin onto those images, right? Truly making them portraits and not likenesses. And so I just love that. And then Donald was in, um, last week or a week and a half ago, and he talked about how that image um, just sort of, he was from the South and, you know, it made him feel seen. And you can listen to that um, recording um, in the gallery. Can I interject for a second and ask you, Thelma, who over some time, I'm sorry, it's the curator's yeah. worst nightmare, but, you know, and in, in the catalog as well, Hilton Alice writes a, a beautiful reflection about being with Thelma mounting your show in 1994 and seeing these Barclay Hendricks paintings going on the wall and this being this transformative moment for him, mm -hmm. witnessing you doing this. And so I wonder, you know, do you have a favorite painting? You know, what, but even how has your relationship with Barclay and his paintings sort of evolved since yeah. that moment? Since a moment, yeah. Um, this is not how this is supposed to go, obviously. Yeah, I'm the moderator, <laughs> and, but um, so what I will say, you know, so favorite work, again, the worst question. You know, this is a body of work that I love. I feel like in the years since we've lost him, getting to see work I've never seen has been a revelation for me. Um, clearly, you know, one of the great, great gifts of being the director of the Studio Museum is that it's a collection that was formed so intentionally. You know, so many of the works that came to us, we were not founded at the Studio Museum by, you know, a fortune or a collection, as is the case in, again, I'm saying, like we're in the Whitney, the Whitney, or the Frick, or so many other institutions. You know, we were formed by a collective. This is actually our anniversary week. Um, the Studio Museum opened in 1968, um, this week um, in September, last week in September. And so we were formed by a collective and the collection formed in that way. And one of the true icons in our collection is Lottie Mama, right? Which greets you um, when you enter the exhibition, but it's a work that Barclay referred to in our studio museum collection as our Madonna, right? Mm -hmm. Because of who she is, his cousin, but elevated right, into this frame with gold leaf. Now you both spoke about works um, in terms of Barclay's technique, that's another one, right? The fact that Barclay knew in this important historic gesture, right, he was going to paint the people he knew, the people who made up his community, but to do it in a way that were like the paintings he saw all through the museums in Europe. And so for Lottie Mama, to exist in that way, and for him to name it for us in that way, um, to say it's our Madonna, has always been the way in which I've understood that work, right? You know, it's one of those things that, you know, I always say, you know, how the universe works. We had a collection exhibition up, been up for probably a couple of months, um, and Lottie Mama was place of pride, as it so often is, and it was up when Barclay passed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and that always for me, you know, reminded me of, of the way in which she exists for us and why we're so proud she is here. But in terms of relationship, what I continue to feel, and this is what I want to ask you about, is that um, I want you both to speak about your sense of Barclay's legacy, because for me, he exists as one of the central figures of the 20th century, bar none. 
And I'm not just saying that in relation to black art, however, that is 100% the case, right? So this moment with its absolute obsession with black figuration would not exist without Barclay Hendricks, right? And the understanding he had about the power of portraiture, the power of representation, the sort of ideals of beauty, but colliding with this absolutely geeky, masterful, constant, rigorous, technical flex, right? Every single painting has some sort of daredevil painting move in it that defines him. So, as we, this being my last question, I know I could talk to both of them for a long time, but can you talk about Barclay's legacy as you see it? Yes, and I can only speak as a nerdy Italian Renaissance specialist who have spent my whole life studying the old masters. Barclay's bravery, I think, his independence, painting when he was painting, if you think of the moment, the years, the decades that he was painting, what he was doing, embracing European tradition in America at that time for black figuration was brave. It was against the grain. It wasn't particularly commercially successful in the sense in comparison to now. And for me, his legacy has been, just from my perspective, people have found a way to the old masters in this like forgiving, generous human way through Barclay's admiration. His sort of generosity of, I know Rembrandt didn't paint a lot of black people, but you can still <laughs> appreciate something about it. So it's this sense of being able to access the past through somebody who had both admiration and saw what was missing. And I'll take that second part of that, <laughs> which is, you know, he's a true interlocker for the present. Right, and so you, as Thelma said, and as Amy just also said, you don't get to bark, you can't sort of talk, and Kande says in his essay, actually in the book, that you can't talk about you know, figurative painting without sort of addressing Barclay Hendricks. Yeah. And you know, so you get Kande, you get Mickelene, you get so many others um, who owe the debt to you know, sort of the service that he did um, with painting. And so I think that, you know, for me, that is the legacy. The legacy is he is a true interlocker between past and present. Um, and I think you see that in the exhibition. And finally, what, what do you want people to know or learn in seeing the exhibition here, right, in this context? So I have two main takeaways, and I... <laughs> Believe me, I prepare these because we've had so much press interest, and this is this is a question that people like to um, end with because it's you know what should people take away from this? If they don't know who the frick is, they don't know who Barclay is. What should... one drop dead amazing paintings? Just I don't care if you don't know who Barclay is, you will walk in there and just see a pretty amazing things. The second thing, and I think is a little bit more let's say cerebral, how human Barclay was as a painter. He did not care. If you knew that Lottie Mama was about Byzantine icons and gold ground, Christian paintings where gold foil meant, et cetera, et cetera. If you didn't have that knowledge or the privilege of trips to Europe, that's okay. He hoped you saw a shiny thing that was beautiful to you. And the idea that anybody with whatever background life perspective that they had could see his works and take something is an extremely generous and human way of presenting art to the world. I think for me, um, it really is sort of this, you know, like to get a sense of the sweep of history, right? And I think we often tell history in one way. And I think in having Barclay in this institution um, that really sort of goes back from the 1400s to the present, that you get a real sense of um, a sort of more inclusive history. Um, and I was hoping that that was what we achieved. And so the exhibition, you know, the context of the exhibition, as we like to say, is the entire Frick collection. It's situated on the fourth floor, um, but we wanted to honor Barclay by giving him galleries and giving over the, you know, the four Frick galleries, but you can wander through and draw connections. And I hope that, you know, the show says something about the sweep of history and, you know, black people's inclusion and place in it. Before I thank you all, I want to say that the experience of the show is magical. So we're going to get to do that. But I also want to compliment 
It's amazing volume that Amy and Antoine have put together, which really looks at Barclay's work in a deep and really meaningful way. This, of course, is available for sale upstairs. <laughs> I'm never not a museum director, so, right. so books. <laughs> right. this is available. But truly, um, the reflections of contemporary artists on the role Barclay has had, reflections on these works as they relate to history, past and present, is really, really phenomenal. So I want to congratulate you all on this book. Thank you for the exhibition. Thank you for the talk. Thank you,